So, uh, uh, as I discussed last time, uh, we started with, with multiple expansions. And uh, today you will understand why we decided to go with the multiple expansions because it's extremely, extremely useful when it comes to explaining the physics of materials and understanding the electromagnetic properties of them, explicitly electrostatic. So <clears throat> just to review that if we assume that we have a specific charge distribution of rho of x uh, prime, then from this rho of x prime, we expect it to find out what's going on with potential. And we assume that there is the boundary, the boundary is at infinity and uh, we are not dealing uh, with, uh, with finding and dealing with, uh, with the boundary conditions here. And from here, we did the expansions of one divided by x minus x prime. And we did it either in terms of spherical harmonics, or we did it in terms of uh, a Taylor expansions in, term, in cylindrical, in the Cartesian coordinate or spherical coordinates. And from these, we find, we found that uh, phi of X, if we assume far field or near field, depending on the situation that we are dealing, explicitly if we go with the far field, we got uh, the following expression, which is one divided by epsilon zero. I'm just writing down what we got from last time. L of M one divided by two L plus one. And uh, from these, uh, that was another expression, which was integral of Y L M star of theta prime and phi prime. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> R prime of L, rho of X prime, <clears throat> D three of X prime. And then we had spherical harmonics Y L M of theta and phi, R power of L plus one. And we call these uh, multiple expansions essentially, so Q of LM. So <clears throat> then indeed one, uh, the potential that we had was in terms of LM, uh, one divided by two L plus one, one divided by R power of LM, uh, sorry, L plus M plus one, and then we had QLM, YLM. And here uh, we, we discuss about the situations and we compare it to the Cartesian coordinate, but it's, it's good to re just review it. Uh, first of all, the, the term here, which defines the magnitude of the potential goes with power of L, uh, power of L plus one, okay, with a negative sign. So we say that if L is equal to zero, then one divided by R term plays a role. When L is equal to one, then we have one divided by R power of two. When L is equal to two, then we do have one R power of three, and etc. And associated to L, then we have a freedom on choice in and on, on choosing M. So M can be from minus L to L. For this specific case of L equal to zero, only we do have M equal to zero. So then we end up with, it, uh, with a term, which is one divided by epsilon zero, one divided by one, one divided by R power of one, Q zero, Y, zero, zero, theta and phi, okay? Which is why it, uh, zero, zero is a constant is, uh, I think is one divided by square root of four pi, like that, okay? Well, for the case of L equal to one, we do have M that's changing from minus one, zero and one, 
And therefore, we have three contributions, which the first one will be Q. Uh, all of them, they go with one divided by R power of two, no doubt. Then the first them will be, uh, uh, will be Q uh, uh, one minus one with Y one minus one. The second term, which is the summation, of course, that you do have. So it will be Q one zero, Y one zero plus Q one one, Y one one of theta and phi. So essentially we do have three terms associated to dipole, okay? So that's for dipole term. That's mono. And quadrupole has this term, which means that M is changing from minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. And therefore that goes with R power of three. And the contribution that we do have is Q two minus one, uh, minus, sorry, minus two. y to minus two plus q to minus one y to minus one plus q to zero y to zero and then q to one y to one plus q to two y to two okay and of course we do have four uh, for other terms that we are looking for. So we, uh, for example, that will be L power L equal to three, which will be one divided by R power of four and etc. So uh, <clears throat> for the dipole, if you look at the terms, what's going on with Y, uh, look at only dipole term, okay? If you look at the dipole term, we do have a few contribution, which is one, 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 zero, and y one minus one. Uh, I, I don't care about the coefficients. I only care about the functionality, theta and phi, and that is theta and phi, that is theta and phi, of course. And now we know very well that goes appears with the coefficient of Q11, Q10, Q1 minus one, which all of them, these Qs, remember, these Qs depends on the geometry that you do have it. So it may appear for some specific geometry, it may not appear for some other specific geometry, okay? How do we calculate the QLM? We have to go back and look at that expression that we had here. So that depends on the charge distribution. But independent of charge distribution, we can talk about the physics of the dipole. So look at the, uh, the uh, y11. One, one. So y11 one, one is given by p1 of cosine of theta e power of i1 phi. So that will be p1 cosine of theta e power of i phi. What about this one is a P1 of cosine of theta. What about this one? P1 cosine of theta, E power of minus R phi. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so P1 of cosine of theta, what is the value? Itself, it will be cosine of theta, E power of I phi, that is cosine of theta, cosine of theta, E power of minus I phi. So if you look at the dipole term, so the, the monopole essentially is just the fixed charge distribution that you assign it here, which is Q00. And it appears with Y00, which is a, a constant value. And it seems that look like a sphere, a spherical charges that you have it at the origin. And then the potential given due to that one is going to be one divided by R. What about the dipole? For the dipole term, that's, let's say, along 
z direction, and of course that's along z direction. What happens? You do have three contribution, which they appear with the coefficient q11, q10, q1 minus one, which the first one goes with cosine of theta e power of i phi. The second one, the same. The third one, the same, with only difference in, in phi. So it seems that the, the contribution that you will go, it, it, you will see anywhere, it goes to be the projection along the z direction, OK? Which is going to be cosine of theta. So if you plot cosine of theta, what it will be the value of the cosine of theta here, it will be maximum value, OK? Here it will be zero at the origin, and the other side it will be negative value. If you plot cosine of theta in, in spherical coordinate. What about e power of i and phi? That depends how the azimuth angle is changing physically. So you may start from zero, you end up with a two pi jump in phase, or you may start with zero, you end up with zero again in the same origin that's associated to first term, second term, or the third term, or you start with zero and end up with minus two pi on the full rotation, because that goes with e power of i phi with a negative sign, that is go with e power of i zero phi, and that goes with e power of i phi. So if the phi is changing, then we do have uh, uh, we do have these changes in, in azimuthal angle. The combination of these, let's say, modes, so let's say this uh, phi dependency, may give you sine of phi or cosine of phi along phi direction. So it, whenever the charge distribution is in that way, you may see, uh, you may see the, the dependency on phi to appear as a sine or cosine or any combination of these two. So you can look at the other case, which is, which is uh, the term, uh, and by the way, and the, the, uh, the potential appears to be one divided by R squared for the dipole term. What about the other, which is quadrupole term? You can just plot them in the same way. And uh, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the potential appears with R power of three. Then there you do have Y to two, y two one, y two zero, y two minus one, y two minus two. So definitely the, the, the azimuth angle appears to be e power of i two phi, e power of i phi, or e power of i zero phi, plus minus, plus minus. So for the azimuthal angle, now you are adding another level of complexity, which is which can the, the phase jump can appear to be zero to two pi, zero to four pi, or zero to minus two pi, zero to minus four pi, or zero indeed. But the, for the theta angle, that appears to be p two of cosine of theta for all of them, and if you look at the that value, that will be three. Someone can help me. 3x2 minus 1, 1 divided by 2. OK, so it will be 3 cosine of theta power of 2 minus 1, which you can plot it. So you can look at the plot of this value. When theta is equal to, when theta is equal to 0, uh, then that appears to be 2. OK, when, uh, when theta is equal to pi, uh, that will uh, pi divided by two that appears to be minus one. So here it will be negative at the origin. Here it will be positive. And and the other side when theta is equal to minus uh, theta equal to pi that will appear to be positive. But here is a positive two value. Here is a negative one value, and here is a positive two value. So if you look at the 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 form, the form is something like that. So it appears like a cloud here and another one here, which is some sort of uh, quadrupole form. So indeed, uh, that was the part that I stopped. Uh, uh, for the Cartesian, I described that. So 
if you have any charge distribution, the expansions that we did, we did have in the Cartesian coordinate, we did, I mean, row of X prime. So it tells us the charge distribution can be given with a point charge plus a dipole charge in any direction, by the way. Okay. Or it can be given by a quadrupole charge, which is can be in this direction, or it can be in this direction, or it can be in other direction. So that's a dipole. That's a quadrupole. And or can be described by any of these distributions, which doesn't have a quadrupole term, but it has a, it has the higher orders. A cube like that with this orientation or the other orientation or the other orientation. So you can you can really switch them. Uh, <clears throat> so that was for the Cartesian coordinate. For spherical coordinate, any any uh, the same charge distribution that you do have it can be expanded in terms of zero zero, which is y zero zero, or can be expanded in terms of y one one, y one zero, one minus one, which means that you do have something like this, or can be y one one uh, sorry two 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 minus two two one two minus one and it will go to zero zero to zero sorry and that means that you do have something like that okay and by the way this part is it should be okay put it in here put it in, put it in here with plus the other tips so indeed, it allows you to, to do the expansions in terms of that uh, specific charge distributions. All right? Okay. So now uh, I will go and I will describe uh, something which is, which is more, more informative. So if you look at the... Uh, the Cartesian coordinate that we describe, or if you look at the spherical coordinate that we, uh, we, we describe. So essentially we pay, uh, we know very well that for the dipole, it's uh, for monopole, it's very clear what is the result, but for the dipole it's a little bit tricky. Look at the dipole term. If you look at the dipole term, we are dealing with these terms, right? So if you look at the quadrupole term, we are dealing with that terms. So in, indeed, for any, let's say QLM value, then the potential that we do have it, which is potential at X, which is one divided by epsilon zero, one divided by two L plus one, due to that QLM is given by QLM divided by R power of L plus one, and then we had YLM of theta and phi. If I'm not mistaken, that will be the result. Uh, R power of L plus one. Yes. Okay. So th that is the expression that you do have it due to QLM contribution. Now the question is that, what is the electric field associated to this QLM? What is the electric field? Yeah. So indeed, the electric field can be calculated based on minus gradient of phi. Is what we deal. But remember that we expand and we did these expansions in spherical coordinate. So it means that the gradient also should be calculated in spherical coordinate. What is the gradient in the spherical coordinate? Is E R derivative with respect to R plus E R, eh, sorry, E theta, uh, e theta divided by 
R derivative with respect to theta plus E phi divided by R sine of theta derivative with respect to phi. If I remember well, that, that, was, that, was, that was the expression that we, we can get it. So if I look at the metric of the space, it will be one, uh, that will be R, and the other one will be R sine of theta, which is, which is, which is correct. Okay, so then we do have electric field, which has essentially three components, which is ER, ER, E phi, e, e, e theta, E theta, and E phi, E phi. Now the question is that what are the ER, what are the E theta and E phi? So ER essentially will be calculated based on the derivative only with respect to R with the negative sign of the potential that you had it. And the same fashion, E theta can be calculated by, based on one divided by R with the negative sign derivative with respect to theta of phi. And then you can also calculate the E phi, which is one divided by R sine of theta derivative with respect to phi of the potential. And we know what is the potential for these uh, um, specific charge distribution or QLM, then ER will be equal to minus derivative with respect to R of the D specific potential, which will be minus one divided by epsilon zero, one divided by two L plus one, then we do have minus L plus one, <coughs> excuse me, QLM divided by R power of L plus two of YLM of theta and phi. Or if you want to simplify that, that will be one divided by epsilon naught L plus one. Two L plus one, QLM, R power of L plus two, YLM of theta and phi. What about E theta? That would be minus one divided by epsilon zero, one divided by two L plus one. Now I have to take the derivative with respect to theta. That will be QLM of R power of L plus one. Uh, one divided by r derivative with respect to theta of y l m of theta and phi then if you simplify that that will be minus one divided by epsilon zero one divided by two l plus one q l m r power of l plus two and derivative with respect to theta of y l m of theta and phi. What about e phi? That will be minus one divided by epsilon zero, uh, pa, 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 one divided by two l plus one q l m r power of l plus one, one divided by r sine of theta, Derivative with respect to phi of YLM, which will be I M the same value, so it will be YLM of theta and phi. Okay. So indeed that will be <clears throat> minus goes away, so it will be uh, sorry, it will be minus I divided by epsilon zero one divided by two L plus one. Uh, pa, 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 uh, Q L M divided by R power of L plus two. And then I have, we do have M Y L M of theta and phi divided by sine of, uh, sine of theta. Okay, so that is the electric field associated to QLM, the multipolar, uh, multiple expansions in the spherical coordinates. Remember that that is true that is derivative, 
but all of the electric fields, E R, E theta, and E phi, they have the same magnitude, which is one divided by R power of L plus two. And that's a note that you have to take it. So the contribution for E R, E theta, and E phi is identical, okay? So for example, I can ask you for, for a dipole term, do the calculation and find out what is the E R, E theta, and E phi, right? Yeah, you can do these calculations and find out what's uh, what is the what is the what is the field. Okay, beautiful. So uh, now remember this uh, this multiple uh, expansions is so powerful that it helps you to understand to understand what's going on with the physics without even going into deep calculation, only considering the monopole contribution, dipole contribution, at most quadrupole contribution. For example, in, <clears throat> in, in nuclear physics, usually this is extremely, extremely important. Anyone doing high energy physics? No? Okay. So, uh, in the, in, the, in the standard model, usually we consider electron to be a point charge, okay? So the electron that we consider is just a point, like um, that point, which has no dimension, all right? And many people, they believe that this is an issue because electrons should have a dimension. And people, they look for that and they want to understand what's going on with the dimension of this. On the other side, I mean, but then what means that we assume that the electron to be look like a perfect sphere. Let me enlarge it, by the way, guys. I'm exaggerating. We are talking about extremely really low, low dimensions, but we can, we can zoom out. And zoom in and, and see what is happening here. So is the electron really a sphere? Is it a shell? Okay, of course it's a quantum, it's a quantum object. Is it a deform? Or is it a perfect sphere? The same situation happens not for an electron, which I will come back to this question. But that also happens with, with proton and neutron, and those are made of quarks, right? Two up quarks, one down quark, or two up down quarks, one up quarks. So what happens in that regime is that you expect that three-dimensional object, which is made of three quarks, they are deformed. So if the deformation is, 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 is look like that, I'm looking at the cross section or the formation is like that. By the way, when we are talking about the formation, we are talking about charge dis distribution, guys, right? We are talking about explicit charge distribution. Uh, of course, it's a wave function. I mean, if you go to quantum mechanical picture, it's entirely wave function, which uh, from the wave function, you can look at the charge distribution. So that, those are the, the questions that you may see it. So always, if you look at these physics, either the electron, or if you look at the proton and neutron, then you are, you are not dealing with, uh, 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 with monopole distribution, because the monopole distribution only look at the, it looks at, but what's going on with the Q00, which is essentially what's going on with the total charge. And the total charge always will be at point in a certain given, which is a, it's the center of mass or center of charge. So essentially, if electron is looked like that definitely in both cases, the monopole term will be a point any somewhere, which is the center of mass or center of the, the symmetry that you do have. However, if the electron is deformed in the second scenario, then what you expect, since the charge distribution is not uniform, is that it's in uniform in space in symmetrical way, then you expect that something like Q11, Q10, or Q, 
one minus one will appear in the calculation, which is a dipole contribution. Okay? So definitely then you, you need to look at what is happening with one divided by r power of two potential. While the previous case you deal with one divided by r. Okay? So, and the same situation will happen. If you look at the proton and neutrons, you will see that the, there is not only a monopole and dipole, but also the quadrupole term plays role. So, and then people, they look at the situation when they have a quadrupole interaction, okay? And, and that's significantly important in, in elementary particles and understanding what's going on with the, uh, with the physics there. So uh, there are research field activities which people, they look for the electric dipole of electrons. So they believe that the electron is not only a, a sphere, but is a little bit deformed, and then it should have a, an electric dipole moment. And people, they are looking for that one. Remember, I, what I'm talking here is not quantum version, is entirely the classical electrodynamics version, okay? So uh, I think I looked, I, I made an example, if I'm not mistaken, um, I didn't. Huh. I didn't make any examples, surprisingly. Okay, uh, I, I could give you an example which is, uh, which is, which assumes that, assuming that in in uh, in, in the nucleus, okay, which is uh, which is proton and neutron. By the way, for neutron is very obvious because the total charge is zero, right? And uh, 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 and I can ask you, and I can tell you the classical version of that is we do have a radius. For, uh, for neutron, which this radius is approximately given by R0, a fixed value, plus R0 with a little bit of deformation, which this deformation essentially, it is given only with L equal to two deformation, okay? I will, I will plot it for you guys just to, to see what is happening. For example, L to M, and then the summation is over M, which is changing from minus two to two of theta M5. Okay? With, of course, the coefficient, which is needed to be, to be defined here, which is a coefficient of two, and then the summation is over M. So what I'm doing, I, I'm saying that if you assume that you have your neutron, in the first approximation, neutron is a sphere in the spherical coordinate, which is x, y, and z, with a certain radius, which is, um, which is uh, r zero. And this certain radius usually is about femtometer. We are talking about that small range is about Femtometer level. Okay. And now we believe that this radius, if you assume for, for a neutron, is a little bit deformed, is not perfect sphere. In some places, is deformed. So you can look at, and this deformation essentially is given by R0 one plus something else. And what is this something else? I assume that for my case, since I know the property of neutron is given by Y2, M, any arbitrary M value. So what was Y2 guys? It was three cosine power of two theta minus one divided by two. Okay, and then I have e power of i m five, which I, I I don't care about that for the time being, and I believe that this deformation is given in this fashion. So if only I look at the theta form, 
the theta places. So what is happening here, if, the, it, if that was a perfect sphere, here it will be a Libby deform, it will be large. Here it will be negative, so it comes inside. Here it will be a Libby large. Okay. And about the azimuth angle, that can be another oscillation with period of two, period of one, or period of zero. One of these three. Okay. And this is what I assume here. Is that clear, guys? Now, I am asking you what it will be the charge, the, the uh, the, uh, the multiple expansions associated to this. Definitely, if you do the calculation for QLM, first of all, you have to do the calculation and you will find out what is the QLM. And from this QLM, you will get the potentials, the potentials that contribute to the field. Not all those will contribute, okay? So only a few of those terms, they play a role. So indeed, <clears throat> QLM will be given by integral of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> the, the first term was, uh, was uh, charge distribution that you needed, which we have to look for. The second term uh, was uh, YLM theta prime and phi prime with a star. Then I, we had R power of L prime, uh, sorry, R prime power of L. Uh, what else? Then we had the volume D3 of X prime. All right. And then we knew that the potential that we have it, the potential is given by one divided by epsilon zero, summation of L and M, uh, one divided by two L plus one of uh, Q L M divided by R power of L plus one. And then we do have Y L M of theta and phi. Okay. So we are talking explicitly about neutron. What is the total net charge? Is zero. Of course. So let's do the mathematics. And we assume that only contribution that happens is due to the deformation of the sphere, which is the deformation of the neutron surface or the volume that we do have it. So indeed, the QLM that we have to do the mathematics, it will be given by rho of R prime, theta prime, and phi prime. <coughs> And then uh, we do have YLM of theta, uh, theta prime and phi prime. Then we do have R prime L. And then we have to write the volume in terms of theta prime and phi prime and R prime. So how do we write that? It, as we discussed last time, it will be R, power of, R prime power of two d r prime, d theta prime, d, uh, sorry, 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 my bad. d phi prime, d of cosine of theta prime. Okay, that is the volume that we do have in, in, in spherical coordinate. So then we do have r prime power of two, uh, d r prime, d phi prime, d of cosine of theta prime. Okay, so <clears throat> I will keep the integral of rho of uh, r prime, phi prime, yeah, theta prime and phi prime. Then I do have YLM of theta prime and phi prime, r, power, uh, r prime power of L plus two, dr prime, d phi prime, d of cosine of theta prime. All right. Good, okay. The only things based on this assumption that we had, the only thing that is changing 
is the radius. We are not assuming that charge distribution is changing. The charge distribution maybe is constant, but we only assume that the sphere is, is, uh, is, is deformed in this specific fashion. And we assume that this term is significantly smaller than one, okay? Or this deformation here is extremely smaller than R0. So then, therefore, we have to replace what we had only for R prime. So it means that that will be R0 power of L plus two, then we do have one plus summation of <clears throat> uh, m alpha to m y to m of theta and phi power of l plus two. Good. So the only things that I'm assuming that is different is, is just the radius, the distribution that we do have it. And that is the, the consequence. Fine. Okay. We assume that this term is smaller than one, so we can do the Taylor expansions and only keeping the first term, the first two terms. That, that will be R0, L plus two, then multiply by one plus L plus two of M alpha to M Y to M of theta to phi. Agreed? Approximate, of course. So, the QLM that appears, it has two contributions. The first one will be integral of rho of R prime, theta prime, phi prime, Y L M of theta prime and phi prime, R zero L plus two, which is a constant by the way. <clears throat> Should I consider it as a constant? Uh, let's consider it not to be an R0, to be an R prime. Because we have to do the integration. dr prime, d cosine of theta prime, d phi prime. And then I have another term, which is plus L plus two, summation of m alpha to m integral of rho of r prime theta prime phi prime y l m of theta prime and phi prime and then i do have uh, pa, 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 r prime l plus two dr prime d cosine of theta d phi prime. Okay. And we know that this term is way smaller than the first term. Okay. We assume that the charge distribution is Uh, okay, which time this was sent? So, uh, Edith, you had a question? Yeah. Oh, um, I, I realized there's prime terms, so my question's irrelevant. Uh, so, it, uh, do you want me to read it or? or? Uh, no, no, no. So, my question was um, if QLM uh, is dependent on theta r and phi, uh, why we didn't consider the derivative of it in the um, electric field, but then I realized there's prime terms on it. So that's why it's- Yes, um, yes. 
Yeah, QLM is, is, is fixed, is not depending on theta and phi, okay? Uh, and it only depends on the charge distribution. Whatever you do have it, and then you expand it, and then you will get, let's say, sequence of them. Uh, okay, fantastic. Sorry, if you have questions, just ask me because uh, sometimes I cannot see the chat room. Uh, I have to look at uh, the chat room. Okay. So, <clears throat> so then we do have two terms. One is what we were expecting from this this spherical symmetry. And we know that, I mean, if you do the integration of the first term, let's look at the first term. Uh, we assume that the charge distribution is uniform. This is something that uh, people usually in high energy physics, they will consider it. So rho of r prime and theta prime and phi prime is a constant. Is it is a constant uniform, let's say, sphere. They don't consider that this, it has a, a, a change in, in the charge distribution. Some places is positive, some places is negative, or some places is zero. So it, we assume that this is, uh, is, is, is a constant value. And then when you take, of course, in a, in a certain values that we consider, then this will be a row zero. And then it will be integral of uh, <clears throat> YLM theta of theta prime and phi prime, D cosine of theta prime, D phi prime, multiplied by integral of R prime power of L plus two DR prime. Because that is only function of theta and phi prime and that is a function of R prime. Okay. What do you get from this term? That will be delta of L zero, delta of M zero with a constant, with a coefficient. Why so? Exactly. We have a coefficient of one and one can be expanded in terms of y zero zero. That's all. Then you will get that contribution. Therefore, that will be proportional to total charge. Okay, which is will be rho zero multiplied by the volume essentially. Good. Which only l equal to zero and m equal to zero will be contributing. So it will be Q zero zero, only it will be contributed. Good. So what about the second term? Look at the second term and the second term is given by L plus two summation of M alpha two M. And based on the discussion that we do have, I can write that is zero zero integral of Y L M star Oh, there was something else. Oh, I have missed that term, by the way, which is very important. Why here there is a missing term, y to m theta prime and phi prime. Okay, so the second term will be y l m theta prime and phi prime. Y two m of theta prime and phi prime, r power of, uh, and d cosine of theta prime, d phi prime. And then we do have multiplied by integral of r prime l plus two, d r prime. Good. Perfect. So whatever we get from this, it will be delta L2 and delta of MM, which essentially we could write it in terms of M prime, but anyway, let's write it. We know that the M will be identical for both of them. So essentially what we will get from this term, it will be L will be replaced by two. So that will be four at the front, 
summation of uh, m alpha 2m rho zero, and then that will be r power of, uh, it will be alpha, r power of L plus t, that will be L2, five divided by five. Uh, then we do have the delta of L2, delta of m. Okay, so that tells us that only Q2m will play a role. In, in, the, uh, in the calculation or in the expansions. The expansions. So, so the physics will be like that. Essentially, whenever you have these, char these uh, let's say radius of the sphere, it deformed from R0 and it goes to be one plus, let's say any value of alpha 2m, yl, uh, y2m of theta and phi, which that goes from m minus two to two, then due to this term, the quadrupole will be contributing. So, essentially due just to the deformation of the sphere that happens. So for example, for the neutron, the total charge is zero. So only that term will play a role, which is the quadrupole interaction that uh, appears in nucleus. Okay. Is that clear guys? So far so good? Okay, beautiful. As soon as you know this, then you can, you can honestly, you can uh, look at, uh, you can look at the energy that you have it associated to this interaction. You can look at the field associated to this. You can look at the potential associated to this. And then you understand uh, a little bit more about the physics of that specific interaction. As I say to you, that is true that is high energy physics. That is true that you are looking inside of nucleus, but that simple approximation even is valid. And people, uh, people, they were able to use it in experimental realization and understanding uh, the, the, let's say, the interaction of the nucleus. Okay. So, uh, uh, right now, what what we will do, we will go and look into the uh, into the energy that is required to, uh, 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 let's say, to keep. A, a specific charge distribution, or when you place a charge distribution in a specific electric field, what it will potential, what it will be the energy associated with that system. Okay. Previously, we we looked into uh, the energy that is required to move charges around and bring them together. I think it was lecture two or lecture three that we looked into that specific problem when we take let's say one by one, and you bring the charge distribution there. And what we would got, we got something like that. One divided by two integral of rho of x prime, potential of x prime, d3 of x prime. That was for bringing specific charges or building of a specific charge distribution in a, in, in a space. Good. That it, the factor of one divided by two appears in the calculation because if, if, if I remember well, when, when we started first with the, with the discrete quantization, the discrete uh, charges, and then we say that due to the, these discrete charges, 
Uh, it seems that we are building up a matrix and the element of this matrix will be, uh, uh, will be diagonalized. And essentially during this calculation, we, we are calculating twice the energy, then we have to do it, uh, we have to divide it by a, uh, by a factor of two, just to, uh, to uh, account for the double calculation of energy, which we have between the charge number one and two and then the charge of two and one. So that was the logic. However, assuming now that we have a field in space, this is the problem, right? this is the, uh, the physics that I described, which means that I have a specific potential in the space. And then I place a specific charge distribution here. Then what is, the energy, since we don't need to, to move the charges around to build up the potential, then the factor of one divided by two will go away. So the total energy will be integral of rho of x prime, phi of x prime, d3 x prime. Because we already, we already Taught that the field is created, we are only placing the charge distribution there. We are not moving around and creating the, the field. Okay, so this field already generated. Okay, in your book, this is not discussed, and the, the factor of one divided by two is omitted. Okay. So I have this specific charge distribution, or you can go with X prime or you can go with X. So uh, the charge distribution that I have, I can assume that there is a specific center for it. I will call it the origin. This is the origin of the charge distribution that I have. And then what I will do, I look at the field around this. So the, now the field, which is here, I look at the field around the, I will call it center of mass, but be careful guys. Um, we are not talking about the mass at all, but the, uh, let's call it the center of charge, okay? So the field then, which means the potential phi of uh, X prime can be expanded around this point, which is the uh, origin. We're using the Taylor expansion, so it will be phi of zero. All right, then, uh, papa plus uh, is it a, a, a vector function, so it will be x dot gradient. Oh, let's write the expansion because I remember that once we have done that. So the expansions was uh, was given by summation of x prime dot nova prime divided by n factorial power of n of phi. Okay and it's changing from zero to infinity. We did that last time. We did the mathematics of this and let's do the expansions. It will be phi, let x prime equal to zero. That will be phi zero plus x prime that nabla prime, phi at x equal to zero plus one divided by two factorial x prime that will be the summation of i j x prime i x prime j derivative with respect to i derivative with respect to j of phi at x prime equal to zero plus the other terms. <coughs> Excuse me. Clear? Fantastic. So, um, 
And I know that uh, gradient of potential with the negative sign is equal to electric field. So gradient of potential at x equal to zero is equal to electric field at zero. Clear? But you can pay attention to x prime or you can just neglect the x prime. It's up to you. It's the coordinate that we choose here in that specific place. So if you want to, if we want to change x prime here to x, is totally fine with me just to reduce the confusion, or you can keep it here. It's the same physics. It's, it's just a variable for our expansions. Okay, so let's do that. So w then will be equal to integral of rho of x prime. All right. Then the field now is expanded, or the potential is expanded in terms of phi zero plus x prime dot gradient of phi at x prime equal to zero plus one divided by two summation of i and j x prime i x prime j derivative with respect to x prime i derivative with respect to x prime j of phi at x prime equal to zero plus the other terms, d3 of x prime. Good? All right? OK. So that term essentially is the electric field at 0 with the negative sign. Gradient of phi is minus electric field where we are evaluating at x prime equal to zero, which means that at zero. Good? All right? Perfect. What about this one? Again, that term, the first one, will be the EI of the electric field, or EJ of the electric field with a negative sign, which is evaluated at x prime equal to zero. And then you have to take a derivative with respect to xj there. So remember, e is equal to minus gradient of phi. So what does it mean that ei is equal to minus derivative with respect to i of phi? So we do have derivative with respect to i of phi derivative with respect to j of this one. So that is essentially minus EI. Good. Let's do the expansions further and see what we get. So that will be integral of rho of x prime phi zero d three x prime plus the other one, which is minus <coughs> E zero dot integral of rho of x prime x prime well let's write it in this way just to reduce a little bit of confusion x prime rho of x prime d3 of x prime and then i have the other term which is again a minus sign appears will be minus one divided by two then it will be summation on i and j integral of x prime i x prime j derivative with respect to j of e i at x prime equal to zero of rho of x prime d3 of x prime plus the other term. All right. <clears throat> nah. Let's write that just to reduce a little bit of confusion again. That means that x prime j. Is that fine? 
Okay. So the energy then is given by phi zero, which is independent of the integral, integral of rho x prime d3 x prime. What is the volume? Total charge is Q, right? Then what about the second term? Will be minus E zero dot integral of X prime, rho of X prime D3 X prime. What's that? Too shy. Dipole? Dipole, exactly. You will have P which is a dipole moment. What about the last term? Let's look at this. It will be one divided by two. I will do the same procedure, multiplying it by three. And then um, I will write it in this way, summation of i and j. Then I have integral of three x i xj oh let's let's write in this way minus something else okay let's do the something else and let's find out what is that the something else essentially is one divided by two summation of ij x prime uh, integral of rho of x prime d3 of x prime x prime i, x prime j, derivative of e i with respect to x prime j at x prime equal to zero. Okay, do you agree? Good, perfect. What is the divergence of the field? Or if you want to, we can write it in this way. Remember rho the divided by epsilon zero? What? Rho divided by epsilon zero? No. Why? Remember the because field. If you remember, the field was independent of the charge distribution. We created the field without even looking at the charge distribution. If you recall, I say that the field is there, right? Yeah. And then I place the charge there. Any thoughts? is zero because that field uh, is not created due to the charge. It's created due to the charges outside of the region, not here. Okay, so what does it mean? This is, means that derivative with respect to x prime i, e i is equal to zero, do you agree? That's a summation, of course, summation of this. Usually I'm using the Einstein notation. Uh, I don't write the, the summation. So let's write in this way, delta of ij, derivative of ei, xj, summation or i and j. What's the volume? Zero. So everywhere the delta will be zero except the case that i is equal to j. So then is these two essentially they're identical, nothing more than that. Can I multiply it by, uh, uh, by r prime, power of two? So can I write it in this way? Summation of i j, delta of i j, derivative of e i with respect to j r prime. Power of two. 
is a constant. You can multiply it and it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, that is equal to zero. Still, this is zero. Do you agree? Perfect. So what I will do with this term, I will multiply the denominator and denominator by three. So essentially, whatever we do have as a ellipse, ellipse there, it will be one divided by six, uh, three multiplied by two, summation of i and j, integral of rho of x prime, d three x prime, then that will be three x prime i x prime j. Do you agree? Because the three goes away. These three and that three, they will cancel out each other. Maybe I, I shouldn't write that way. Good. Perfect. Then what else I will do? The summation is outside. I will add minus delta of ij r prime power of two. And the rest is the same. It will be derivative of ei with respect to x prime j, which is evaluated at x prime equal to zero. That is true for any places, including x prime equal to zero. All right. Good. So now let's simplify further. That will be one divided by six summation of i and j. And then differently, that quantity is independent of the integral. So it will be integral of rho of x prime three x prime i x prime j minus delta of i j r prime power of two uh, d three of x prime multiplied by derivative of e i t prime j. What is this? Do you remember this? I see Gavin's lip is moving. Uh, is it the quadrupole moment or whatever? Exactly. This is a QIJ. It's a quadrupole in Cartesian coordinate that we solved last time. So that will be one divided by six derivative, I'm sorry, summation of I and J, quadrupole term of I and J, derivative of E I X prime J at x prime equal to zero. So essentially that term is one divided by six summation of i j q i j derivative of e i with respect to x prime j and x prime equal to zero plus that term. <clears throat> Clear? So, is there any question? Let's look at the physics. What's the physics here? Um, it tells us that if you take an object, any charge distribution, place it in an external electric field place, or you have these charges distribution and suddenly you, <coughs> excuse me, suddenly you turn on the electric field and electric field is not time dependent. Uh, and what you will see, you will see specific energy associated to having this charge distribution in the electric field in, the, in, in that places. What are the contribution? First, if that object has a total charge that's in, within the first approximation will be the total charge multiplied by 
the potential. This is what you will get the first time. It's Q times the potential at that place. So if that has a charge of, let's say, two column, which is, which is it's, it's really high, it has a charge of two column, and then you place it in a potential of 20 volts, then simply you can calculate what is the energy associated here. But it ha may happen that this, this doesn't have a char net charge, but has a dipole moment. Then the second term plays role. It will be the electric field or derivative of the potential dot the dipole moment that is interacting here. Okay? And then if it doesn't have an even dipole moment, then you have to go to the quadrupole. And then the de derivative of the field will play a role, not that field directly. So first, it will be the potential for the, total, uh, for the net charge. For the dipole moment will be the field or derivative of the potential. When it comes to quadrupole, then it will be the derivative of the field or second derivative of the potential that plays a role. Clear? Yeah, perfect. So that's, that tells you really which approximation you should hold and you should stick with when you are really looking at the energy or estimation of energy of an electromagnetic system or electrostatic system here explicitly. Good. Let's look at the, a, a specific case when uh, let's let me write it down, then uh, then we can discuss about that. So in uh, the energy then is given by net charge times the potential at that place, which is the center of mass or center of charge, plus oh sorry minus uh, p dot the electric field at that place as well, minus one divided by six, summation of i j q i q j in i j, uh, derivative with respect to x prime i, doesn't matter is x i or x j, x, x prime or x, at x prime equal to zero, plus the other terms. And remember, we assume that if the field is like this, then we put the charge distribution here, and that's the origin that we consider. Now, <clears throat> I'm asking you, what happened if I have a dipole? and another dipole. So, and looking for the energy between these two. So what does it mean? I'm assuming that I have a specific dipole here, and then I have another dipole here, which means that this dipole is creating a specific electric field that is this the electric field, and then I'm looking at the energy between dipole number one and dipole number two. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yes, go ahead. Can, can we again now here consider that the divergence of the electric field is zero? Where? Ah, so around the second dipole, we consider it yeah, because we consider now I don't have this. Okay. What is the division of relative field? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is zero. So the point is that exactly that's the that's the true question. Where are you looking for? The divisions of the electric field is not zero when you are looking at the places that the charge is is is, is located and 
that electric field is associated with that charge, okay? This is what I told you. I say that, look, I have this electric field and then I'm placing the charge here. I have never said that uh, where the electric field is uh, created due to which charge distribution. It is somewhere else. And I'm not talking about that places. I'm talking only about this place. Here, these divisions of E is zero. Good? Clear? Okay, perfect. So now I have a dipole, that, that was your question? Oh. Um, yeah, that was my question, but like, uh, I have a smaller question. Of course, go ahead. For seeing the quadrupole behavior of this charge distribution, the, the way that the electric field is like changing in space has a role. So it means that, for example, if you apply like a constant electric field, we'll not see the quadrupole behavior even if the charge distribution has a quadrupole. So if the electric field is constant in space, Essentially, the derivative of it will be zero. Yes. So it doesn't matter what whatever you place there, a, uh, even if it's a quadrupole contribution. If you even take a quadrupole, if you place it inside of a constant electric field, um, it seems that there is that doesn't require the energy. It's due to the symmetry that you do have it. Okay. Because it, it, look, if you remember, that's a quadrupole, an example of a quadrupole. Right? There's an example of a quadruple, these two together. I'm placing inside of an electric field, which is like that. Can I give you a, a hint? Whenever you feel that the geometry is changing, then you have a problem. It means that the energy is changed. So, this is the electric field, which means that the electric field is constant. So it doesn't matter, electric field here or electric field any places is identical. So if I take this quadrupole, which is this quadrupole, right? Which is stuck together. They are not able to move with respect to each other, these four charges. Clear, guys? which means that also if it's negative, uh, negative, positive, negative, positive, so that will be negative, positive, so will, there'll be a charge distribution to that. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Now, take this, move it here. Nothing has changed, right? Like, yeah, nothing is changed. So the energy is zero. So for all of the upper um, like terms that has these sorts of symmetries, in a constant electric field, the energy will be zero, right? Remember. These two, due to the fact of the quadrupole, we are not talking about the dipole. If you have a dipole, even in a constant electric field, you do have energy. You have to, if you place it there, because if you move it around, still uh, you will see the difference. But here, no. In this specific case, no, the energy due to the dipole is zero, due to the quadrupole also is zero. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course. Is it clear? No other? Okay. So now let's go, I'm sorry, this will be the last example because we will conclude the energy part and we will go to completely new field. So <clears throat> not completely new, it's related, but uh, uh, a new subject. So um, let me erase this part. Assuming that, I, I, as, as I say, assuming that you have a dipole, This dipole is creating a field in space. And now I'm placing another dipole here. So the dipole number one is creating the field. 
or the potential if you want to look at it. And then I'm placing a dipole here. What is the energy associated to this? Energy, the net charge of these, the, the red one, the net charge will be equal to zero, right? So the energy will be equal to minus P dot E at X equal to zero, which means that at this location, essentially. Is that clear? Perfect. So what is E? Which E should I place there? Mahta? So uh, what do you mean which E? So shouldn't we just put the E in the position of X equals to zero? But yeah, but the E is created due to something, right? Yes. Due to which one? Which of those dipole is created? The left side or right side? So, um, because we're considering the uh, energy of the right side, we should consider the electric field of the left side. Exactly, exactly. So that is the electric field associated to, uh, to the left side, right? So how we can find the electric field is simply minus gradient of the potential. What is the potential for a dipole? If you remember, we calculated during the previous lecture was minus gradient of uh, one divided by four pi epsilon zero. That was the constant that we had, and it was x dot p divided by uh, x power of three. And remember, x here was the point of observation, the point of observation. Good. All right, perfect. So now let's take the derivative of these. So essentially it will be, still we are doing, we are calculating what is the electric field due to the dipole moment of the, uh, of the left side at the position of the dipole moment of uh, right side, which is the red one, okay? So let's do the, the, this calculation. So the electric field will be minus uh, one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Then we have to take the gradient of x dot p divided by x power of three. So, and x is this distance, by the way. This is the distance of x, just to, to, to visualize it. So taking the derivative of that, so that is minus one divided by four pi epsilon zero, that is a derivative of i of two fields, which is uh, x dot p, uh, okay, x dot p, one divided by x power of three, uh, plus one divided by x power of three, oh, sorry. x dot p derivative of i of one divided by x power of two. So what is this, the value? Derivative of i of x dot p. So it means that you have to take the derivative with respect to x of, or x one of, x one, P1, X2, P2, X3, P3. What will be? It will be P1. What about the derivative with respect to, uh, uh, sorry. Derivative with respect to X2, P2. Derivative with respect to X3 will be P3. So the entire of this will be a vector of P. All right. What about 
the last term, which is the derivative with respect to i of one divided by x power of three, which means that that will be the derivative with respect to x i of one divided by square root of, oh, let's say, x one power of two plus x two power of two plus x three power of two power of three divided by two. That will be minus three divided by two. And then that will be two x i. All right, divided by uh, x power of five. That will be minus three x i divided by x power of five. Do you agree? So then the electric field that I am expecting, it will be minus one divided by four pi epsilon zero, P divided by X power of three, minus X dot P times, three x divided by x power of five. You agree? No mistakes? This was the electric field due to the dipole moment on the left side. Can I call it dipole moment of P1, guys? Let's call it P1. P1, 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 okay? Or P prime is up to you. Let's go with the P prime because we use the index of uh, P prime, P prime, P prime, okay. So the energy now is given by minus P, which is the dipole moment on the right side, dot the electric field due to the dipole moment on the left side, which is that will be minus one divided by four pi epsilon zero, P prime divided by X power of three. And the X is the distance, by the way, between the two dipoles, the center of two dipoles, minus x dot p prime, three x prime, s of the three x divided by x power of five. Simplifying this, you will get one divided by four pi epsilon zero, the minus goes away. Then you have p dot p prime divided by x power of three minus x dot p prime with the coefficient of three, x dot p divided by x power of five. Okay, that's the energy between two dipoles. If you keep them together, so one of them is like this, which is, a, we call it P prime. The other one is P, which is located here. And that's the center of, the two dipoles, which the distance is given by x. And is from the p prime towards the p. Clear? Can you tell me, guys, what is the, um, of course, I mean, this is the, uh, remember, by the way, the, the dipole energy goes to, to be one divided by r power of three. That is clear from the first term, but it's a little bit hidden in the second term because the second term is given by x dot p, which will give you a scale of r, x dot p prime, which gives you another scale of r, and then dominator is r power of five. So it will be, r power of two divided by r power of five, that will be one divided by r power of 
three. Okay. So, and now let's look at several different cases. So when I have two dipoles, which they're oriented in the same direction, parallel, and that's the center for each of them. So for this geometry, which I will call geometry of number one, P prime, P and X, they are in the same direction, right? Which means that they are parallel to each other. So P dot P prime will be P P prime. X dot P will be X P P with without dots. And also X dot P prime will be the same because they're all parallel together. So then what you will get, it will be the energy for this system will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. It will be P P prime minus three P P prime divided by <clears throat> x power of t. Right? What does it mean? That is negative, which is my, uh, the coefficient of one divided by four uh, pi epsilon naught is a scale. I will take it out. It will be minus two p p prime divided by x power of t. which means that the energy is negative, so it's more stable, right? What about this geometry? Which I will take the dipole like this and another dipole like that way. P prime and P. And that's X. So that will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. P and P prime, they are opposite direction of each other. That will be minus P, P prime divided by, uh, sorry, X power of T. And then X dot P will be negative. So it will be plus T. X dot P prime will be positive. So that will be T, P, P prime. That will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. That will be two p p prime divided by x power of two. That will be positive energy. Okay, so really it depends on how do you take the dipoles and moving them around. So then you will get different energy. So the energy depends on the distance, first of all, depends on the x and depends on the orientation of the dipoles. You can even keep them like that. So what is happening, x is orthogonal to p, x is orthogonal to p prime. So the last two terms, they will be uh, zero, okay? The last term will be zero. Then p and p prime, if they're aligned, it will be positive energy. If they're anti-aligned, it will be negative energy. Good, so that's easy to see. So here I will stop, uh, sorry guys, it took a, a little bit longer. I will see you at 4.30, okay? I will stop the video. Perfect. So <clears throat> thank you very much guys. So uh, <clears throat> and now with the multipolar expansions, uh, we now going to understand a little bit about the materials. And really depends on the level of complexity that you want to go for. It's, the situation gets very, very complicated. So far, we only consider, <clears throat> we only consider a, a vacuum as places that we do the mathematics and we are looking for finding electric field and, and uh, potential. Now we go and we look into other cases, like for example, going inside of material. And we know very well that when we, I mean, we just discuss about the, what is happening in nucleus. So uh, assuming that you have atoms and these atoms, they, they are made of electrons, proton and neutron. And it happens that the either this atom is ionized 
or it bonds together, it will be a molecule or the molecule will be uh, different molecules essentially. And then uh, you will have a polarity for those molecules. So then uh, it acts like a, like, a, uh, like a dipole moment. For example, if you look at the molecule of water, which is made of uh, uh, oxygen and, and hydrogen, then you will see that uh, uh, the negative charge and positive charge distribution, they are different then you will see a dipole moment for, for water. And this is the first thing that we learn in, in school. So they start to rub a, a plastic and then you uh, keep it close to, to uh, a tap water and you will see that the, the direction of the tap and the, the water will change depending on the plastic that you hold. So it shows that really is, is, is a dipole moment there. Now, now the question is that when it comes to material, how do you really should handle electrostatic? Okay, so we, when it comes to the material, but I mean, we can start using the expression that we had previously, which was um, finding the electric field or finding the potential using this expression, one divided by four pi epsilon naught integral of rho of x, <coughs> excuse me, x minus x prime, dx, d3, x prime. Uh, sorry, that was the potential. Or uh, the electric field, which we have to take the derivative, which was minus negative of, uh, of this, which was one divided by four pi epsilon zero, integral of rho of x prime. Sometimes it's good to remember, remind ourselves that dealing with the electric field is a little bit uh, difficult because you have to do a vector calculation. And then it was x minus x prime, power of t, d3 of x prime. So, <clears throat> and remember that this row was the charge distribution, charge density that we had. Assuming now that, that uh, we are, if we go to the, let's say to atomic scale, okay, we look at the proton neutron. So we look at individual atoms is ionized. Then we can look at what's going on with the charge distribution, which is look like a point charge or maybe several point charges. Then definitely we can find what's going on with the electric field. It's easy, it's easy calculation and we have done previously. But in reality, when it comes to laboratory scale, we are talking about the minimum dimension that usually we deal with is millimeter scale, right? Is one millimeter scale or maybe micron scale. And if we talk about the cube, essentially we are talking about a scale which is like this, a millimeter by a millimeter by a millimeter. So essentially is 10 power of three minus three power of three meter cube. This is the dimension that we are dealing with. What is the dimension of atoms usually, I mean, roughly speaking, is angstrom size, is 10 power of minus 10, right? So the dimension for the atoms that we do have is roughly speaking is about angstrom, which means that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's roughly speaking, the dimension will be 10 power of minus 10 meters. So if we look at the volume that we talk about, uh, then the, in, in a linear way, essentially in one millimeter, roughly speaking, uh, what we have, we have something about 10 power of seven atoms. Right? Roughly, of course, we are not saying that they are stuck to each other, but that's the, that's the, the statement that we can, we can say securely. When we are talking about a cube of one millimeter, we are talking about 10 power of 21 atoms. So inside of that cube, roughly speaking, we have order of 10 power of 21 atoms inside which usually, if we zoom in, this is what we will get. 
we will get something like a lattice or amorph or whatever you, you want to consider. Okay. Which the atoms are located there. Each of these, they can have by then or their self, they can have a specific charge distribution. For example, it can be a miracle. Right, it can be, uh, uh, we are talking about that range. We, it, it can be a molecule which may have a dipole moment and not a net charge, or it can be an ion uh, which, is, which may have a net charge and maybe also a dipole moment or a quadrupole, okay? So the situation gets very, very complicated that essentially using this formula, it's very, very difficult to be handled because that talks about individual atoms, not talk about the macroscopic system. When it comes to macro macroscopic system, everything is vibrating, right? Because we do have a temperature. If you go to absolute uh, zero uh, temperature, then everything will be stopped vibrating. But whenever we have a temperature, we do have a motion for those atoms or those molecules. So essentially they are, jiggling along and then due to that what you have you have a charge distribution which is function of time as well which is moving around then all of the calculation that we may handle it will be extremely extremely difficult okay oh my god so what what we have to do so we know that really going using this formula explicitly will not give us the proper result because first of all we have to, first of all, we are talking about the macroscopic system. We are talking about many, many, many body issues, which is the solid state problem that people, they look. You have to look at the partition functions and understanding what is going on with energy. And on the other side, what is happening is that we have to remember the temperature destroys almost everything about the, the let's say, uh, uh, fixing the charge distribution in space. All right, so that's, that's really the point that I want to raise for you. Now, the question is that, what are we talking about? Now then, we are talking about an average electric field for this sample. Average for that volume, what is happening. Average charge density that happens for this range and et cetera. And average means in time and also in space. We are talking about these two cases. So for either if it's periodic system, you have to do it over a period or if, uh, 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 or a volume as well. Or if it's not a periodic, you are, you are taking for a longer time in such a way that the, the, the functionality of the time, uh, it, it goes away. So <clears throat> in any cases, what I can say that for these individual molecules, which I do have it in a space, these strange molecules that I do have, right? Then we want to find out what is the electric field or, uh, or potential at the point of observation, all right? So that's the problem. Now, look what I want, I'm going to do, I'm going to find out what is going on with electric field or potential due to this cube of material, okay? This cube of one millimeter by one millimeter. But now I am going inside and I'm looking at individual molecules and seeing what is happening and using the approximation and understanding the property of material to simplify the calculation, all right? So now I'm looking at one, let's say, set of molecules. It can be one molecule, it can be a set of them. It can be maybe a hundred thousand billions of them, okay? All they are around. I will call it molecule number one or I, all right? So now I only consider that specific case, which is molecule I which has, which for my coordinate system that I choose, that is located at X I, all right? Point of observation, 
is here. This is X. But each molecule has its own system, coordinates, which means that each of these places, they have an X prime, which I am looking at the distribution around the center of mass or center of charge that I do have there. Is that clear? It looks like having a charge distribution. And I look at the center of these, and I'm looking, I, I'm using this as a measure to look for the charge distribution around that point. Okay. So now the distance from this specific point of study to the point of observation is given by x minus x prime plus xi. X prime plus Xi, it's the point is this place, which I am studying it from the point of observation, uh, sorry, from the coordinate. And then I look at the distance between these points and the point of observation. Good? Remember, that can be an ion, that can be a molecule, or it can be any, any materials, which, which is the atomic scale, okay? Later on, we may do also the averaging in time and space on that, but we will discuss about that. But that's, let's say, the molecule or the molecular scale of object I, or it can be object one or two or three, whatever. And we have many of them that we have to do the integration or we have to do the summation over. So at the point of observation, which is this point of P, we want to find the electric field. How do you find the electric field, guys? Electric field at this point of X from that specific molecule is given by one divided by four pi epsilon zero integral of rho of X prime because remember the integral is happening on X prime, X minus X prime plus X i <clears throat> divided by X minus X prime plus X i power of three, D three of X prime. I could do that also the calculation for for potential, I'm doing it explicitly for electric field for a specific reason that you will see later on. Questions? Sorry, Go ahead. The, the argument shouldn't be like, okay, so now we're considering that X prime to be the, the place, like the coordinate of each particle in that charge distribution. Yes, so X, X prime is, is within that specific value. So the, arg the argument of the integrate integ integral shouldn't be like x prime plus xi? No, because we know that outside of that, after the, the x prime is zero. There is no charge distribution. Whatever happens there is, is just around that charge distribution. But like you're, you're putting in the, like the form of x minus, the rest of the integrant, you are putting x prime plus x i. Like, is it Where? like it? So Where? it's x minus x, it was x prime, right? Over x minus x prime to the power. Oh, of no, no, remember, that's nothing to do with the integrands. It's, it is only about the distance. The entire base is the distance. Right? Okay. There is nothing about the functionality, it's just distance. Oh, yes. yes okay. Sorry. And thank you, by the way. I recall that there is a missing process here. <laughs> okay, good. Is that clear, guys? It's about the charge distribution. And then you do the integration on the charge distribution, whatever. It's just the charge distribution is located on X prime. And then that's the coordinate for the, for the charge distribution. Is that clear? Note that X prime is way smaller 
then x minus x i. So geometrically speaking, we are talking about that small region of x prime, right? Which is that region. And that distance. This x prime, as we discussed, is angstrom scale. And the point of observation, which is x minus xj, or xi, which is that place, x approximately is x minus xj, xi, because the x prime we assume is extremely small. Then that point of observation, which is millimeter scale, is way, way, way larger. Clear? Good. So I'm erasing this. So no doubt about that. I think we are all agreed that X prime is way, way smaller than X minus X prime. And sorry, sorry, X i. Good. All right. What I can do if we do have such a situation? And remember, the integral, as Nazanin pointed out, the is integral is on x prime. Where is the x prime? Can I call it molecule? On the molecule. Because I know that outside of the molecule is zero. All right? Perfect. Now it comes the fun part. How do I, how should I do the simplification? Everything in physics is approximation. <coughs> Excuse me, how should I do the approximation? I already gave the hint, which is this. Halo expansions on expansion can be you. Beautiful. Exactly, you have to do the expansion sense. Okay. Remember, when it comes to this sort of calculation, usually people they care about dominator more than nominator. Because the change in the dominator will be way significant than what is you have it as a coefficient. So the expansions usually happens for one divided by x minus x prime minus x i power of three. Okay. Or let's do simplification and do it for without power of three, just in case. I will tell you why. So that will be essentially I have to have two terms fighting. One, it should be way larger, the other one should be smaller. So that will be one divided by x minus xi is what we call it the larger term. And the other one will be <clears throat> x prime. Either you can do it the expansion in terms of spherical harmonics, in terms of Cartesian one, or whatever you wish, or I would say that since what we have done with the dipole, it's way easier just to do it in terms of the dipole expansions. So that can be approximately given by <clears throat> one divided by x minus xi, which is what you get it as a first term, all right? Plus, x prime dot del, right? This is what we have done just a few seconds ago. With respect to uh, uh, <clears throat> remember i, then one divided by x minus x i plus the other terms, which I don't consider for the time being. Good? All 
All right? Perfect. Because the point of observation is fixed, by the way. This is what we do. So, <clears throat> and of course, if you want to include the other term, it will be one divided by two factorial x dot nabla power of two, right? One divided by x minus x, xj. So this is what we, we learn. So it will be x prime dot nabla, power, nabla j, so i power of n divided by n factorial. So I don't care about the rest, but let, let's now do, uh, do this sort of mathematics. So <clears throat> the electric field is given by one divided by four pi epsilon naught integral on the molecule side, okay, of rho of x prime. And definitely, I can write the entire of this term, which is x minus x prime plus xj divided by x minus x prime plus xj power of three as the gradient with the negative sign, right? I'm writing in terms of potential. One divided by x minus x prime minus xi d3 of x prime. Do you agree with that? Right? That is what we did the mathematics previously, and that was uh, shown. The and we did uh, we showed that uh, the minus gradient of one divided by x minus x prime is equal to x minus x prime divided by x minus x prime power of three. So now x prime can be replaced by x prime plus xj. Uh, xi is is the same. All right, so <clears throat> that will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero minus gradient acting on rho of x prime, one divided by x minus x prime minus xi, d3 of x prime. Good? Essentially, this is nothing more than the gradient minus gradient of phi, right? So now this one will be expanded in terms of what we had previously. It will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero minus gradient of integral of rho of x prime. Let's do the expansion will be one divided by x minus x prime, eh, sorry, xi plus x prime dot nabla i one divided by x minus xi. plus the other term. Good. The row is there, so everything should be fine. All right. So that will be approximately one divided by four pi epsilon zero minus gradient of integral of rho of x prime divided by x minus xi d3 of x prime uh, plus gradient i of integral of rho of x prime no sorry
<laughs> okay. Integral of rho of x prime, x prime, v3 of x prime, dot i on divided by x minus x prime. Oh, sorry. x i plus times. All right. Good. Any question so far? Go ahead. Sorry, just a simple question. Where was the derivative being taken in? Like at which point? It was a oh. specific. <clears throat> At the point that x prime is equal to zero, which I already placed there. I already applied the derivative at x, x prime equal to zero. Okay. okay. Yeah, because it's one divided by x minus x i minus x prime, right? Taking the derivative, but since the x prime and x i, they have the same sign, is the same derivative essentially. And then I take the x prime equal to zero, and then all they go. Okay. Good. So that will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Good. Oh, let's do it in a different way. It will be minus gradient of one divided by four pi epsilon zero integral of rho of x prime, d3 of x prime, one divided by x minus x i. Is that good? That's the first term. What about the second term? Will be plus one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Uh, <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Uh, integral of rho of x prime x prime d3 of x prime dot gradient of i one divided by x minus x prime uh, sorry x i plus the other two what is the value of this is the total charge of that molecule which is i call it QI. Do you agree? The total charge associated to that specific molecule. What about this one? Is a dipole of that molecule, which I will call it PI. Is that fine? Good. And of course, we do have the other terms, which is the quadrupole, hexapole, octapole terms, and etc. We don't consider that. But what is happening? Essentially, the electric field for that geometry is given by minus gradient of qi divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 divided by x minus xi plus 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. Pi dot gradient with respect to i of one divided by x minus x i plus the other term. So essentially, whatever you do have for the geometry that we have in the space for the i molecule, and watching it here at the point of observation, then there will be several contributions. One, as I described in the previous discussion that we had for any object, even that is true for a molecule, that molecule can be divided in several contributions. One is a monopole with the charge of QI. Then it will be a dipole in which direction, I don't know which direction it is. It can be a dipole of PI. 
And then it will be a quadrupole, which is a tensor, essentially, a, a quadrupole of QIJ, or octopole, which will be TIJK. So that will be the approximation. So entire of these molecule objects that you do have, it, the molecular structure will be exactly expanded in that term. We don't consider the rest because they are extremely small. We only consider these two, which is what we call the monopole and dipole approximation. All right. Now we can expand it to many, many molecules. Now we will go with that, but remember that this is the mathematics that we have. And now we do the expansions for any other cases. Let's look at that. So I do have one molecule here, molecule of I, another molecule here, which the same is the same molecule, but different orientation. Another one here, another one here, another one here, another one here. And I want to find what is going on with electric field at the point of observation of P, which is far away from them, okay? Then what I have to do, I have to calculate the electric for each individual and then sum them all together, which is exactly is the expression that we had it on, on the upper side. And then the only things that I have to apply is doing the summation. And electric field, remember, uh, uh, is linear. So it means that it, the superposition rules apply to all of them. So you can, you can just simply do this calculation. So the electric field due to all of them will be minus gradient of summation on I from one to N QI divided by four pi epsilon zero one divided by x minus xi plus approximated, uh, approximated by one divided by four pi epsilon zero pi dot gradient with respect to i of one divided by x minus xi. Agreed? Good. Fantastic. <clears throat> now, now that I know I discretize the system with individual molecules, now I find the contribution from each molecule to be appearing as a monopole and a dipole. I get this summation. But this is not what we do and still look for that because no one is calculating these number of molecules. And essentially what you have to do from a discrete space, you have to go to a continuous space. So you assume specific charge distribution and you assume specific dipole moment distribution that you have or densities. So indeed for the QI, Essentially, if you want to write the QI, you can even write it in terms of the delta IJ, a delta of the coordinate. So you can say that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, if, if I, say, I consider that the, I have a, a row of X, uh, for example, uh, let me look at that coordinate if that's XI, uh, papa, X prime, then if I assume that I do have summation of 
QI. Delta of X prime minus X I. Then you can look at what is happening with, uh, with integral of rho of X prime D three of X prime. That will be essentially the summation of QI. All right. So what I'm doing, I'm replacing in each of those QIs, I will replace them with the delta function. And then I will go to the entire the volume. This is what we do usually from a discrete quantity to a continuous quantity. So then the electric field will be at the point of X will be given by minus gradient of integral on d3 of x prime, right? Then, uh, let me take away one divided by four pi epsilon is zero because uh, it's always an issue. So it's one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Then I have integral of rho d3 of x prime divided by x minus x prime plus the other term which is 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 integral of I will assume also the p is depending on x prime dot gradient of one divided by x minus x prime d3 of x prime. Okay. Good, clear? What I have done essentially just I move from a discrete, let's say, space of x i to a continuous space of x prime. Okay, from x i, I went to x prime. Don't get confused with the other x prime guys. Don't get confused with the other one. I'm just using. I miss. You can go with x second. Okay, so it's, it's just a. Look like summation, the index that is repeated, but it's, it's nothing. Has, remember, x prime has nothing to do with the previous definition or previous notation. Okay, just to clarify that point. Now we have to, I mean, this, by the way, I, I may have forgotten, but this is what happens. P of X prime is equal to summation of PI delta of X prime minus X <clears throat> I, okay? And what are, what is the unit of delta guys? Delta of X, what is the unit? One divided by length. Which length? This is a three dimensional space. Okay, uh, then uh, volume. Exactly. Then the Delta is a volume, but remember that the entire this, right? Look at this. P I, right, was dipole, dipole moment. All right. What is happening with the P now? Is it dipole moment? Is it dipole moment per in the volume that you consider? Oh, 
or density, essentially. Exactly in the same way that we define rho. What is rho? Is the total charge per volume or charge density. So it's a dipole moment that essentially you will find it, uh, the, the charge, the density of dipole moment in a specific volume that you do have. Okay. So this is very important that you, you should consider it and you should remember that. Now, in order to simplify the case, you can, someone can, can do the averaging of these electric field for a specific volume, which the volume is a little bit vi vibrating, but the total, in, total volume is fixed. So it's just jiggling around. So the entire the volume is fixed, but is moving around, okay? You can do the same mathematics. You can do the entire the expansions. And essentially what you will find, you will find exactly the same expression. You'll find exactly the same uh, elliptic field. The elliptic field for this, this distribution of dipole moment, which is molecular dipole moment, and distribution of charge densities in space is given by these two terms. One is due to the monopole and the other one is due to the dipole moment, okay? And that's explicit expression that someone can get it, okay? So essentially we have electric field, which is one divided by four pi epsilon zero minus gradient, of integral of rho of x prime d3 of x prime divided by x minus x prime plus the other term which is integral of p of x prime dot gradient prime of one divided by x minus x prime the three of x prime. This is monopole. This is the dipole. Remember, this is the charge density of the molecules. Okay. This is the dipole moment density of the molecules. Guys, I know uh, I, I may ask you for five to seven minutes and then we will drive what I was looking for and then we will be done for today. Um, <clears throat> let's take a divisions of this electric field. Remember, what is that? What is this electric field that we found? Is for that cube, Right, that cube of one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter that we found. What are the elements inside of that? It's discussed in terms of rho and p, which is the dipole moment density and charge density of the molecules there. Essentially, it can be, you can do the, the calculation and it's, it gets even, even a, a little bit nicer, I would say. But now let's calculate what is going on with the divisions of the electric field. Can we do the calculation? It will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Divisions of a gradient. It's Laplacian, right? It will be divisions of a gradient, which is Laplacian of two terms, rho of x prime, divided by x minus x prime, d3 of x prime, plus integral of p of x prime, dot nabla prime, one divided by x minus x prime, d3 of x prime. Good. So it will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero, Laplacian will not act on the row of x prime. It will act on one divided by x minus x prime. So that will be integral of row of x prime 
Laplacian of one divided by x minus x prime, d t of x prime, plus the second term also, this Laplacian will not act on the p of x prime and nabla prime, it acts on only the other term. So it will be integral of p of x prime dot gradient of Laplacian one divided by x minus x prime. Agreed? Agreed, guys? Perfect. What is this term? Minus four pi delta of x minus. Minus four pi delta of x minus x prime. What about this? The same, minus four pi delta of x minus x prime. All right, so that will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. Then I will get from the first term, I will get, by the way, I've, I, I've forgotten the minus sign here. There was a minus sign here. Oh, let's put it here. Minus, minus, that will be minus four pi, and that will be a rho of x. Do you agree? Good. What about the second one? It will be integral of p, which is the polarization of x prime, dot nabla prime. The four pi goes away, it will be minus four pi here of delta of x minus x prime, d3 of x prime. What is this quantity, guys? Can I do this? That is minus gradient of delta of x minus x prime, because that is perfectly Symmetric with uh, anti symmetric with that. Do you agree? Then the delta, uh, the uh, 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 then the delta, uh, the gradient will be out of this, so it will be one divided by epsilon zero rho of x. That will be minus because the other minus goes away. Uh, that will be gradient of integral of p of x prime dot oh gosh yeah okay that will be minus ingredient, uh, uh, sorry, the divergence of P of X prime, delta of X minus X prime, D3 of X prime. Okay. Good. Which that will be at the end, one divided by epsilon zero, rho of x minus divergence of p. Good. I, I dropped a step on the last part because it's almost seven minutes jump. Then it is passed. So you have to do a pi part for the last one. Okay, if you do a pi part and going with the divisions, then it will be simplified. So now let's see what I have. I want to just get to this equation because it's important and then we will be done. It will be rho divided by epsilon zero. I uh, saw so, 
Um, rho divided by epsilon zero, and that's x, of course, minus divergence of p epsilon zero. So multiplying both sides by epsilon zero, then we will get divergence of e e plus p is equal to rho divided by epsilon naught. Or if you prefer, you can write it in this way, divergence of E plus uh, or you can write it as divergence of D equal to rho, which D is defined as epsilon zero E plus P. So the, we call this displacement vector, which is given by uh, the electric field plus the dipole moment densities. So whenever you have a material, then electric field contribution, the electric field contribution, so previously for any material, we had this for vacuum. We had this contribution, which is, uh, why this is happening? For vacuum, we had this situation, which divergence of E was, rho divided by epsilon zero. But for material now, divergence of E is given by rho divided by epsilon zero minus, <clears throat> or let me write it in this way, one divided by epsilon zero. Oh, it's funny, it doesn't write anything. Okay, epsilon zero rho minus divergence of p. So in vacuum, it seems that you have only three charges that plays role. Here, inside of material, it seems that you do have three charges and what we call it, the charges due to the polarization that plays a role. So the, uh, the di divisions of P will act like charge densities and, and play a role and reduces the electric field. So essentially, you, what you need to do inside of the material the rho will be replaced by rho minus divergence of p, which we'll be discussing about that uh, during the next lecture, and we will solve the, the problem for several uh, physical issues, okay? So that's the important message of the today's lecture. So when we go inside of the material, the polarization distribution, or what we call it, uh, the dipole moment density plays role. And they will, they will either reduce the electric field or they will enhance the electric field depending on, on what is the value. We will discuss about the chi being in a linear regime or nonlinear regime. So uh, we will discuss about that next lecture, okay? So I will stop here, the recording, and I will see you next uh, Wednesday.